Your 20s define the rest of your life. They can set you up for a loving family, successful career, and rich community, or they can be wasted chasing the wrong things. I read The Defining Decade when I was 23, and it completely changed the trajectory of my work, my relationships, and what I chose to focus on and value. And today, I'm gonna share six key lessons from the book that you can use to ensure your 20s put you on the right path. First up, optimize for career capital. Who would you rather hire to build a website for you? Someone who studied web programming and has a 4.0 GPA to show you, or someone who's been working the last two years building websites and has over 100 glowing reviews to show you? Obviously, the person that has been there, done that, is a better person to hire. This person has more career capital, which is a shorthand for what you know how to do and who you know. Once you graduate, your GPA and majors don't matter very much, and if you rely solely on your college education, you're going to be very disappointed. Also, if you want to build a meaningful career, then you should spend your time early in your career optimizing for career capital, not money. There's a great saying, uh, learn in your 20s, earn in your 30s. Choose a company or a job where you'll learn the most, grow the most, and most importantly, nurture useful relationships for the future. This is something I covered in my video on how to profit from chaos and be anti-fragile. If you just take a high paying job where you aren't developing broadly useful skills, like investment banking or management consulting or something, you're actually making yourself really fragile. Whereas by focusing on developing skills like self-education, networking, marketing, design, programming, uh, writing, you become more anti-fragile. If you went to a good school, you might be tempted to take a job in you know, something high paying and prestigious like finance or consulting, but it's important to be really honest with yourself here. Unless you know that you love those fields and you wanna do them for a really long time, it might be better to forego the high salary for a lower paying job where you'll generate more career capital. For example, let's say that you wanna start a business. Some consulting firms like Deloitte or whoever will tell you, come work as a consultant for two years, then start a business. You'll learn a lot about running one. It's a bold faced lie and they know it. You're gonna be in a much better position to start a business in two years if you spend two years trying to start a business, not if you spend those two years doing corporate consulting, working with companies at totally different scales than startups. So whatever you think you might want as a career in the future, try to build career capital and relationships with people in that area now, instead of just trying to make as much money as possible. By the way, most of the business tips I share on this channel center around things that will build you career capital, launching online products, creating multiple income streams, investing and learning and a personal brand. So make sure to subscribe to get more of that. And if you're not sure what that career is, then you might need to explore your unthought knowns. When I was in high school, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. But when I got to college, my friend group pushed me in a different direction. The seniors in my business fraternity counseled that entrepreneurship was too risky and that I should do corporate consulting for a few years first. I eventually realized that was nonsense and got back on the entrepreneurship path, but I lost two years of potential progress from listening to them. I'm just glad I didn't lose more. Deep down, we all have long held desires about who we want to be. But as we grow up, our peers, parents, and society often push us away from this identity. Maybe you grew up writing and wanting to be a writer, but you ended up in some big corporation that you don't care that much about instead. If you've been on the practical career path for a few years, both in college and after, it's easy to forget about your original ambitions, especially because the short-term financial incentives are hard to pass up. Jay suggests trying to find your unthought knowns as a way of reconnecting with what you really want to do so that you can really start shifting your life in that direction. An unthought known is something that deep down part of you knows about yourself, but you don't think about it anymore. It's the self-knowledge that we repress to fit in with the expectations of our peers and surroundings. It might be scary to pursue a career path that's less lucrative and more meaningful, but as Jay points out, there's never gonna be a better time in your life to do that than in your 20s, before you have kids, a mortgage, and other big obligations. So how do you find your unthought knowns? You need to connect with a younger version of yourself to see what you were thinking about and valuing. Try to find any journals or diaries you wrote, or just think about what you used to want to do when you grow up. You can also ask people who've known you for a long time what they think you might want to do, so long as the person you're asking isn't the one who pushed you in the wrong direction in the first place. And in order to embrace those unthought knowns, uh, you're likely going to have to let go of formulas for success. For the first 22 years or so of your life, you have a very easy formula for success. Do the work assigned to you, get good grades, 
Use those good grades to get into the next place, wherever that's a good high school, college, or job. At each next step of your life, you just repeat the same formula. You perform the steps in middle school to get in a good high school, perform the steps in high school to get in a good college, you perform the steps in college to get a good job, but then what? Jobs don't have grades usually, and if your job does have grades, like quit yesterday. Uh, most of getting a better job comes from your abilities and your network. There is no formula anymore, but it's very tempting to try to hold on to it. This is where the phenomenon of A students end up working for C students comes from. In school, following the formula got you A's and accolades, but post-grad following the formula might just lead to you doing lots of busy work and trying to impress people who you don't actually need to impress or even care about the opinions of that much. Meanwhile, the C student who was never very good at following the formula is suddenly thriving because they're better at making their own rules for success and thinking outside the box. If you want to be happy and successful, whatever that means to you, you have to let go of the idea of following the formula. What got you here won't get you there, to quote the Marshall Goldsmith book. Instead, Jay suggests taking time to figure out what success and happiness mean to you, then designing your own criteria to judge if you're doing a good job towards those criteria. Without grades, you'll need to come up with a new barometer for your success that's based on some internal locus of control instead of pleasing authorities. If you don't do that, you're likely to get extremely stressed out and anxious over everything work-related because you've lost the formula. The last thing you want to do is get strung out and depressed trying to win an unwinnable game. So let go of the old formulas for success and make some new ones for yourself. And another part of the programming you're going to have to undo is to learn to become comfortable in uncertainty. The great thing about the formula for success in school is that it provides certainty. Do A. It'll probably happen. Study hard, you'll get good grades, you'll get into a good school. But just like the formula doesn't work in the real world, the real world doesn't really provide much certainty. There is no linear path to success or answers. You have to become comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen in the next months and years. This connects a bit back to an example I shared in my video about being anti-fragile. If you want to learn a language, go try to pick up people at a bar instead of using Duolingo or a textbook. The uncertainty and that stress will accelerate your learning and growth so much more, and even though it's tempting, to do the easy thing and just you know follow the steps in Duolingo or whatnot, it's not gonna make you the same progress that you would get by being more comfortable in uncertainty. Companies will lure you in with false promises of certainty, like the 15-year career track to becoming a partner, but these are mostly stories companies and individuals tell themselves to try to cope with the uncertain future, and you shouldn't give up pursuing a meaningful career for the dubious promise of a more certain future. And since you can't have certainty, it's really important to choose something. Don't optimize for options. The worst mistakes I made in my earlier 20s were from being afraid to commit. Afraid to commit to a location, a job, a partner, a lifestyle. Compounding interest is one of the most powerful forces in the world, and growth in an area always starts off slowly. But as you're growing, it gets bigger and bigger, and it's able to grow at an ever-increasing rate. 7% annual growth on a $10,000 investment only gets you to $19,671 after 10 years. But let that keep compounding for another 30 years and suddenly you're at $149,744. <laughs> Think of compounding growth like a snowball rolling down the hill. It starts off small and slow, but as it rolls down the hill, it keeps getting bigger and faster and by the bottom of the hill, it's massive. This is an incredible characteristic of growth that's easy to forget since it always starts so slowly. And that slow growth is what pushes us to starting off lots of little snowballs and then getting frustrated when they aren't suddenly massive. It's tempting to treat your 20s like an all-you-can-eat buffet, where you get to sample tons of different jobs, lifestyles, cities, relationships, and that settling down in one area of your life is something you can put off till your 30s. But if you're always going back to the top of the hill to start a new little snowball, you're never getting to the bottom of the hill where your snowball becomes huge. Optionality tricks us by making us think it's a good thing. But by not committing to anything, you're not truly growing. As the classic finance saying goes, options are meant to be exercised. There's not much value in just collecting options if you never do anything with them. So instead, Jay suggests actively trying to find things to commit to in your 20s. Don't try to find the perfect partner. They don't exist. Instead, find someone you connect really well with and you can decide to build a life together with. Don't try to find the perfect job. It doesn't exist. Instead, try to find a career area that excites you and commit to becoming incredible in that field. 
don't try to find the perfect place to live. It doesn't exist. Instead, try to find a city with like-minded people where you can invest in building up a great community over time. Optionality is tempting, but you don't get a huge snowball by constantly restarting the process. Forgo some optionality, commit to something, and you'll experience much more growth and satisfaction in the long term. And the most important thing to commit to is to deliberately cultivating a relationship. The biggest area people in their 20s regularly fail to invest in is in their romantic relationships. They feel for two reasons. One, they jump around between a bunch of different relationships to try to find the perfect partner. Or they slide into a serious relationship without deliberately testing it. The first problem, jumping around, is the same problem we talked about in the last section. We want to find the perfect relationship, so we give up on relationships that could absolutely grow into something great because we have an unrealistic ideal in our head. But that's not how relationships work. Just like how compounding interest snowballs, a great relationship takes a lot of time to build. And if you keep restarting that clock, you'll never be happy. Instead, don't try to find someone who's perfect, but find someone who shares your core values and is on a similar life path as you, and who you can see yourself building a life with. Fights, frustrations, and annoyances are going to exist in any relationship. Don't look for someone you'll never fight with. Look for someone who you can work through disagreements with well, and who will invest in a great relationship together. But you also have to be careful that you don't slide into a committed relationship, which is the other mistake many people in their 20s make. The story goes like this. You start dating, and then one of your leases is up, so you move in together. You live together for a few years, then suddenly it feels like it's about time to propose, so you get engaged. Then after a year or two, you're married, and suddenly you've committed to a life together without ever seriously testing the relationship or making sure that that level of commitment is right for you two. Instead, you should stress test your relationships and make sure you're right for each other and can endure stressful situations together before committing to each other. One great way to do this that Cosette and I did is to do an extended backpacking trip together, which we did by traveling around primarily Southeast Asia and staying in hostels. Spending six weeks in countries where you don't speak the language, you're staying in small rooms, missing flights, and having no time away from each other is a very powerful way to make sure you're compatible and and potentially want to spend your life together. As soon as we got back from that trip, we moved in together because we knew if we enjoy that chaos together, real life will be easy. And it made us feel comfortable doing things like getting a dog a few months later or moving to Austin a year later. So don't jump around between tons of different relationships and don't slide into a commitment without testing it. Find someone who seems like they could be a good fit for you, give the relationship a deliberate stress test, and if it passes, go all in. You don't want to be 35 scrambling to find someone to marry when you realize you're running out of time. If you want to build a successful relationship, life, and career starting in your 20s, this is one of the most powerful books you can read. Another book that can help a lot is Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, which I did a similar summary on talking about how you can design your life and work to profit from chaos instead of being afraid of uncertainty. And that video should be right over one of these corners, <laughs> and I definitely recommend checking it out next. Uh, aside from that, be sure to subscribe because I talk a lot about how to make the most out of your early career and share what I've been learning along the way from books like this and other places. And if you found this video useful, there are a bunch more coming. So thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.